History is a tale that never really has an ending. Although it is the past, it is still being made today. Good evening, everyone. I'm Donna Terrell. For African Americans, phrases like the first this or the first time in history spark joy and excitement. They are moments that we are so excited to celebrate, followed by questions like, what's next? Then enter the only grandchild of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He inspired millions around the world, and now she aims to pick up where he left off. I spoke with 15-year-old Yolanda Renee King on the campus of Spelman College in Atlanta about her new picture book, We Dream a World, which is a tribute to her celebrated grandparents. I am ready to keep my eyes on the prize that you set out before us with the power of your vision. Words lifted off the page from the only grandchild of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as Yolanda Renee King reads from her new picture book, We Dream a World. Yes, Grandma Coretta. Yes, Granddaddy Martin. I am ready. She calls it a letter to her celebrated grandparents. Let's talk about the book. What inspired it? Well, I think that for a very long time, we've needed a, um, a message to the world of, of what type of world we can have. And I think that if you look at movements, it's led by young people. This socially engaged 15-year-old if I could speak to my, my grandfather, grandfather today, today, has been sharing her message to large crowds for years, including the one here with her mom and dad, Martin Luther King III, at the March on Washington. I see you've been giving a lot of speeches. Mm -hmm. You like doing that? So funny that you've asked because actually, um, if you ask my parents, um, I've always loved talking. I've always had something to say. And she's saying it with passion. I'm 14 years old and I'm just getting started. And conviction, speaking last year at an MLK program at Clemson University, taking on tough issues like homelessness and violence. I know it is my duty as an American to use the platform given to me by my grandparents' sacrifices to uplift the voices of my peers. I think I've always had a concern about these issues and, I, and I've always heard his speeches playing around the house. This young change maker says in her granddad's speeches and books, are the answers to reimagine his dream. He left us behind homework, and I, I feel like we've been procrastinating on that homework. Andrea Waters King uses her wisdom to support her daughter. She recalls a reporter asking Yolanda if she wanted to pattern herself after Dr. King. She thought about it for a few seconds, and she quickly said, yes, I do, because those footsteps are important, but I want to make my own footsteps. The book? a continuation of Yolanda's calling. She described herself as like it, it, ha having an itch, you know, that you just have to scratch. Well, I feel like I have an obligation to continue the work that he didn't quite get to, that he didn't get to reach. We, we are, going are going to be, be, going to be a, a great, great generation. generation. Blazing her own trail of social activism, Yolanda takes with her Dr. King's legacy. We are ready to reach his name. To rise, to sparkle like stars in a bold blue sky. And his dream. From today to tomorrow, we dream a world. Yolanda Renee King never met her grandparents, but feels their spirit is always with her. The book was released right before what would have been Dr. King's 95th birthday. You can find stories of the King family and African American museums around the country. Their mission is to preserve our stories. Now, nearly 160 years after the first African American museum opened, the Mosaic Templars Multicultural Center in Little Rock continues that duty. Tylisa Hampton shows us how they are bringing a new perspective to how our stories are told. From the melody to the pictures on the wall. 
It's many stories throughout Arkansas history weaved together that make up the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center in Little Rock. The museum first opened 15 years ago, but in the past five years, museum director we Keith Fletcher so says they began a renovation project that so cost $3.5 million. In retrospect and reflective, we knew that there were so many more stories that were yet to be told. It was time to take things up. 15 notches and go bolder and, and bigger. Now that the renovations are complete, the museum features new exhibits and galleries, some of which have AI technology where guests can have conversations with civil rights leaders. Ask them questions like, what's your favorite color? And what was it like to be a part of the civil rights movement? And were you scared? Right, And have the person actually respond back to your very specific questions. But it's not just what's featured inside the museum that showcases history. It's the museum itself. The the museum actually sits on the foundation of what was the black community here for Little Rock. When John Bush and Chester Keats, two formerly enslaved gentlemen, started the Mosaic Templars of America, they had no idea that over 140 years later, we would still be telling their story. Fletcher says no matter who you are or where you come from, every voice is heard throughout the walls. The museum isn't just a black history museum, it's a museum of Arkansas's history and culture hoping everyone sees themselves in each picture. I hope that when they look at the photos, when they listen to the stories, um, when they take pictures, when they go and tell their, their family and friends, that they feel like they're walking away with a part of Arkansas with them. Being the first can sometimes be a tall order to fill. I'm not thinking about history until somebody told me that, hey, you know, you're the first. I didn't know it until somebody said it. As we continue to share our stories, is being the first worth it? From the natural state to the nation's capital, Police Chief Pamela Smith has been making black history for years. Her humble beginnings in Pine Bluff are what helped her rise to her newest post as the top cop in Washington, D.C. She spoke with Leonard Fleming about her path of firsts. I certainly didn't see the path of becoming the first African-American chief in the agency's 230 year history. Pamela Smith spoke about her appointment in 2021 as the United States Park Service's first African-American female police chief. A few big city police chief mentors were always encouraging her to dream. And it's not necessarily about the fact that I'm an African-American woman who's made it this far. A woman who grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas with a single mother addicted to alcohol wasn't done making history. One year after she retired from the Park Police and joined the Metropolitan Police Department as his chief equity officer, another opportunity arose. Then Chief Robert Conte was retiring. Smith applied. I didn't call anyone. You? No, I prayed. I prayed and I said um, to the Lord, because I'm a believer in, in the Lord, if this is what you want me to do, when I wake up tomorrow, allow this to be D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser made her the first black female chief in history last year. The historic nature of her rise in law enforcement never dawned on her until after she achieved it, she says. I think it had everything to do that I was prepared for the job. And again, I'm not thinking about history until somebody told me that, hey, you know, you're the first. I didn't know it until somebody said it. Law enforcement seemed an unlikely career for Smith. She had family members locked up. She went into the foster care system at 13. Growing up was really tough for us. We were kind of raising ourselves. But a pastor's family adopted her, and she began to flourish, running track in high school and college and majoring in education. But police work kept calling. A park police official on a horse in New York recruited her to join. She spent 24 years in a variety of posts from San Francisco to Atlanta. Now she has a tall order in D.C. with rising crime. I'm, I still have the same passion and desire to, to help people, even as I sit as a chief of police in the nation's capital. I believe the best is yet to come for me. Smith's Christian faith has gone hand in hand with her law enforcement career. The chief is also an ordained minister, and she says that will continue to guide her wherever her career path takes her. Honoring Black History continues by honoring our pioneers. It's spectacular. I think the statue just embeds my father's legacy. Inspiring others to keep pushing forward.
John H. Johnson was a pioneer in the magazine world. His Ebony and Jet magazines were once found in just about every African-American home. Johnson was born in Arkansas City in 1918. He eventually moved to Chicago during the Great Migration and cultivated his life's work before he died. Now, nearly 20 years after his death, his legacy lives on in a day dedicated to him and a statue to honor him at the Delta Heritage Trail State Park in his hometown. The journey he began in 1945 when his first issue of Ebony was published is now a motivational stepping stone for children with big dreams. It just shows you what can happen and how you can succeed. I would hope that my father's legacy would represent to them a sense of aspiration and inspiration. Inspiration turns a new page as a new magazine hopes to help its readers develop a deeper love for the contributions of black Arkansans. Within the pages of this magazine, Noir, lies the culture of Arkansas through a different lens. Dorothea Wilson spoke with the magazine's founder about her strength to stay the course and share our stories. About a decade ago, we had this thought um, what if we started sharing stories about the people um, who make Arkansas what it is, who help to add so much richness to the culture of this state? What was once a dream has now become a reality for former KARK Fox 16 executive producer Stephanie Jackson. The premier issue of Noir Magazine launched November of 2023, and as the visionary of the project, Stephanie says she did it to showcase the African-American experience in Arkansas. We wanted to create a publication that depicted our people beautifully in a way that, you know, we just hadn't seen before. The process was daunting, but being told thank you by a featured artist in the magazine gave her the strength to continue the course. She told me that on the day I was really discouraged. And so when she told me that, I said, oh my God, no, you can't give up because it matters in so many other ways that you didn't recognize. And for that reason, among others, Stephanie will continue to be an outlet for artists and creatives in Arkansas's African-American community to share their work in print. And that just means the world to me, to be able to provide an opportunity like that. And I didn't even go into it with that forethought, you know, but to hear that that's the, having that type of an impact is just, oh, it's so amazing. The magazine will be released quarterly and features stories about African-American health, history, finance, music, artistry, and family within the African-American community. A digital copy can be found online at noirarkansas.com and in bookstores throughout the state. I'm taking a story of low and moderate income community members that weren't invited, that are not, won't be in a room, that won't have a seat at the table, or be a voice. Uh, I'm taking those stories to the stage. From magazines to movies. While he may not be an actor, Little Rock native Arlo Washington can say that he is a part of an Oscar nominated film. He is the star of documentary The Barber of Little Rock. Washington has been a barber for more than 20 years. He is also the owner of People's Trust, the first Arkansas black owned bank. The film explores the racial wealth gap in America, the economic challenges that individual, low and moderate income individuals and community members face in access to capital and credit. The Barber of Little Rock is directed by John Hoffman and Christine Turner. It's been nominated for Best Documentary Short. We'll be rooting for The Barber of Little Rock when the Oscars are held Sunday, March 10th. You can find natural state talent hidden right in front of you. That Super Bowl Sunday halftime show with Usher and Friends, choreographed by Arkansas's Sean Christopher Freeman. Freeman graduated from Parkview High School in Little Rock. We spoke with Freeman in 2022 when he was selected as the skate choreographer and skate captain for Usher's Las Vegas residency. He told us then that his passion for skating was born at the Arkansas Skatium in Little Rock when he was younger. Besides working with Usher, Freeman has also performed at the Billboard Music Awards NBA Finals. He is also a songwriter and teacher. 
Still to come, following the new wave of activism, how this new generation is taking notes from activists before them to create their own journey of freedom. The story of the Little Rock Nine is perhaps one of the most known moments of Arkansas's part in the civil rights movement, when nine black teenagers dared to break racial boundaries and integrate Little Rock Central High School. That was nearly 70 years ago. Now a new wave of activists are following in their footsteps and charting their own paths for change. Caroline Derby shows us the steps one young man is taking to do just that. That started, you know, helping me to reflect on, hey, maybe this is a destined calling. Growing up in the heart of Little Rock, the history of the city was intertwined in Tim Campbell's life from the start. Living just blocks away from Central High School, his mother would clean homes and he would tag along. I didn't know at the time that one of her, uh, one, of, one of the people that she was working for was actually the Daisy Bates and I would be over to this house every day. Campbell was destined for activism at a young age and watch others pave the way for what activism looks like now. He has seen the changes over the years and how people stand up for what's right and fight against injustice. With justice comes peace. Flash forward to 2020, a time when he says the world was hurting when George Floyd was killed. And I remember gathering friends, gathering family and just say, hey, this is something that needs to happen here in Little Rock. He saw marches taking place around the country, deciding he would have one in Little Rock. And with the click of the post button, the message was sent. I didn't expect it to get any, you know, any real fluid. However, I checked my Instagram like a few minutes later, it was like a viral post. And so I'm like, oh, wow, whatever I plan to do, I've got to do it. When he showed up to the steps of the Capitol, a few hundred people were there, but that was just the beginning. When it was only three, four hundred, right? When people started going live, posting, doing stories, more people came, right? And so we have this kind of telecommunication thing going on, right? Where everybody is on the same page, just through a click of a button, which is powerful. Campbell says what technology has done for activism is not just connect more people, but connect them instantly. I stroll and I see something, I'm like, wow, somebody's being, you know, misused, mishandled by, let's say, a police officer, right? I see it in real time. I don't have to wait till the newspaper come out. I don't have to wait till 5 o'clock until the news come on. It's right there in my face. Different than decades ago. We can just comment, we can like, we can stroll, right? But then they didn't have all these technologies. Um, they had to communicate whether they liked each other's politics, whether they didn't like each other's politics. Social media movements take place often, creating a global connection. Campbell spent time in West Africa advocating for the people who lived there. His social media post to get people to the march at the Capitol was seen there. And then his friends abroad got a permit to march. And so when I watched the videos of, you know, Gambians, right, hitting the streets, expressing themselves, doing the exact same chants that we were doing here in America. There was another emotional moment there. Like, wow, what can happen when you own your voice? With pictures, videos, and more available at a touch of a button, using the tools we have now to carry on what he saw then. When we come back, a final thought as we celebrate this Black History Month. Our history is as much a part of us as our future, and it is our present where we gather our strength to make a difference. The stories of our grandparents, our mothers and fathers, they are all woven together to become the dreams that our children can one day see come true. It is because of those who have come before us that we have the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. As we take each step of that journey, we have these stories and more to guide us. Thank you for joining me as we honor black history. I'm Donna Terrell. Good night.